Good morning. It's a delight to be here. Um, I want to start by saying as a lifelong Brooklyn Dodgers fan, uh, my hat. Uh, I don't want you to confuse it with that other team from Boston with a B on it. Uh, I, I uh, want to congratulate the Washington Nationals and Washington Nationals fans. Uh, somebody gave me a substitute hat to wear, uh, but it's so warm in here I don't think I will. But in any event, I want to tip my hat to the Nationals uh, in winning their first World Series since 1924. Uh, the Dodgers, of course, have not had a losing season for 75 years. Uh, and at least in Brooklyn, and um, and so uh, what the Nationals' victory shows is that history repeats itself. Although sometimes it takes nearly a century to do so. Uh, what I would like to talk about today is the way in which baseball, in a sense, creates a sense of civic education. Uh, so here we have our Nationals team winning, and everybody's crowding around them. But the important thing about baseball is that in addition to being a game, baseball is a entirely coherent, self-contained legal system. It is a legal structure. And if you think about it, it is the only sport like this. First of all, it has a highly educated, highly trained, professional set of judges. Unlike, say, that other sport where they throw the holy spheroid on weekends, uh, where everybody points out that the people who are actually arbitrating the game usually don't know what they're doing. Uh, baseball umpires have to go through minor leagues. They have to go through training. They actually have to be promoted to the major leagues. It's a very different system. And nothing in baseball happens without a judge ruling. It's not a strike, it's not a ball, it's not a fair ball or a foul ball until an umpire makes a ruling. If you watch a game, spend one day watching the umpires. It's really fascinating. And, of course, the, because the umpires are there, we have to think about how do umpires think about baseball. Uh, we also learn by watching umpires and players how to follow rules, how to accept the ruling of courts. A batter stands there with a lethal weapon, a heavy wooden stick. He's a big person or she's a big person. They're healthy. They're, they're, they're athletes. Umpire says strike three. What does the batter do? Goes back to the dugout. They may whine. They may complain a little. But they go back to the dugout. They don't stand there and argue the call. And why is that? Because as we learned in a league of their own, there's no crying in baseball, right? You struck out, you have been, the judge has ruled on you, you're gone. Um, similarly, what we learn from baseball is that while you may argue with the umpire, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, there are limits to what you can say just as in a courtroom. You can be held in contempt of court for the way you behave to a judge, and of course you can be kicked out of the game. There are certain things you cannot say. You cannot defame the umpire. You cannot say certain words to the umpire. If you don't believe me, watch the movie Bull Durham. Those of you who have seen it know what I'm talking about. So in this highly legalistic game, with this set of judges, and there are four judges in a normal game, seven judges in the World Series, the game often turns on how you read the rules. You'll see in a baseball game a manager storming out of the dugout not to dispute what the umpire saw, but rather to dispute the rule the umpire applied. I've actually watched games where the manager is pointing to the rule book and saying, you don't understand the rule or you've misapplied the rule. You haven't read the rule properly. Um, you don't see this in other sporting events. And of course, the judges themselves, the umpires, are like common law judges. Think of three umpires talking. The first one says... I call them as they are. The second one says, I call them as I see them. And the third one kind of smiles and says, they ain't nothing till I call them. If you understand that, and we all grew up understanding that, then you can understand whether we like the outcome or not, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Clarence Thomas can legitimately adjudicate a case before the Supreme Court even though they come to the decision from very different perspectives. 
And this year there was a case which was a nine to one case uh, in which Thomas and Ginsburg agreed. Ginsburg wrote the opinion. I'm, I'm thrilled to say she quoted me in it, so that's why I know about this case. But the point is that we accept the legitimacy of the ruling because we accept the legitimacy that there may be different ways you approach the law just as the umpire says, I call them as I see them, and the other umpire says, I call them as they are. So this is part of what we learn. Similarly, you will see a batter occasionally turn around on a called strike. Batter does this. He's not telling the umpire, you idiot, why don't you get glasses? He's asking a simple question, where was it? Because what the batter wants to know is where is the strike zone today? Now, if you know the rules of baseball, you know that the strike zone is from the armpits to the knees, over the plate. Well, if in major leagues, with 100 mile an hour balls or 90 mile an hour balls, if they called the strike zone that big, we'd have infinite number of 15 inning one run games with tons of people striking out. So in fact, while the rules of baseball have not been formally changed, there is in fact a constitutional jurisprudence in baseball which says nobody calls the strike zone as it's written because if you did it would destroy the game. And just as it's very difficult to amend the Constitution by a formal amendment and so we have the informal amendments at times through judicial interpretation, so in baseball the umpires have amended the Constitution. By the way, there, there's talk about having you know balls and strikes be called by computers. If they did that the game will be destroyed instantly because the computer will call the full strike zone because it will be programmed to do so and that will make the game so weird that nobody will want to watch it. There's also pellet process in baseball. On a check swing, when the batter starts to swing and pulls back, and the umpire calls a ball, the catcher can appeal that call to either the third or the first base. It's an appellate process, and it's a legitimate appellate process because the first or, or, or first base or third base umpire can say, no, he actually swung, it's a strike. And you can argue, as I've said, and people do, every little leaguer is a future lawyer. Every little leaguer is a natural litigator because we all understand that you can argue, but when you lose, when the umpire says, no, I'm not changing my mind, and of course they never do, then you go back to the dugout. You don't get up and scream obscenities at the umpire. You don't say the umpire is illegitimate. You don't say I don't have to follow the rules of the judge because we live in a society run by a constitution and baseball is run by its own constitution, the rule book. And as I said, there are certain things you can't say to an umpire. Furthermore, you can't touch an umpire because if you touch an umpire, you get thrown out. And that leads to the sacrosanct notion that we have in this country that we don't attack the judges. Unlike many countries, there have been very, very few instances where judges have been attacked by angry plaintiffs, angry defendants, angry people in courts because we grow up understanding that the judge, like the umpire, is not somebody you hit with the bat or hit with your fist. Uh, the former Yankees manager, Joe Girardi, who is now going to move to where I live, Philadelphia, to be the Phillies manager, he often comes up to an umpire to argue like this. Sticks his nose right in the umpire's nose, right in his nose, but his hands are, why does he have his hands clasped? Because he doesn't want to get excited and wave his hands, because if he hits that umpire by accident, you're out of here. You're out of the game. So this is all part of the process of understanding baseball. Now, baseball has arcane rules, but the development of the rules reflect the development of law in the United States. Take the infield fly rule. You all understand it, right? Of course not, because it's a really complicated rule. But let me explain. It's really not that difficult. If there are fewer than two outs, and there are runners on first and second, or runners on first, second, and third. And there is a fly ball that is hit that could be caught by an infielder with ordinary effort. 
And by the way, it doesn't have to be in the infield. It only has to be able to be caught by the infielder. So there was a, a game a few years ago where the ball was like five feet behind the infield. It was still called an infield fly rule. What that means is the batter is immediately out. Why is the batter immediately out? Because the assumption is that the infielder can catch this ball with ordinary effort and therefore the infielder is making the out. But why do we have this rule? We have this rule because otherwise the guy could drop the ball. And if there are runners on first and second or runners on first, second, and third, they now have to run because now it's an automatic out. And therefore, the fielder can get a double or triple play. However, if the runners think he's going to drop the ball and they run, then the fielder catches it and he can still double them up or triple them up because they left the base before the ball was caught. So the infield fly rule, now you all understand it, right? Do I need to do it again? <laughs> Uh, now you all understand, the infield fly rule is essentially an anti-fraud law. Because what it is doing, and th this is very important, what it is doing it, is it is preventing the fielder from committing fraud by doing something for which the runner has absolutely no defense. Because remember, if he drops the ball, the runner's going to be thrown out. But if he catches the ball and the runner ran, he's still going to get thrown out. So the infield fly rule essentially is an anti-fraud law. The infield fly rule reflects the notion in American law developed and articulated by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes that law is the result of experience. So that early in baseball there was no infield fly rule. And then in a game where an infielder dropped a fly ball, not on purpose, by the way, it wasn't a fraudulent act, just bad play. The newspapers the next day said, wow, what if he did it intentionally? He could start doubling people up. And so immediately, the experience of baseball leads to a new rule. This is how our legal structure works. The other piece of baseball is that baseball is a team sport. Baseball teaches you to be a team player and even to make sacrifices as a team player. The sacrifice blunt, the sacrifice fly. This all illustrates the way baseball works. I want to give you an example of the counter example. That famous sport where everybody obeys the rules and everybody follows the rules, the sport of golf. Because of course golf is the ultimate self-dealing game. Right? Golf players write down their own score. <coughs> if the ball can't be played properly, they drop it over their shoulder, but a little push it can go a lot farther, right? Golfers have do-overs, right? Oh, well, I swung and I missed. I get to do it again. Uh, they call it a mulligan. There are no mulligans in baseball except the guy's last name sometimes is mulligan. You can't self-deal in baseball because unlike golf, except at the very professional level, there are referees and judges in baseball. There are not. And so what we learn from baseball is that we live in a rule-bound society. We live in a society where law matters. During the American Revolution, this guy, Thomas Paine, he did not play baseball, as far as I know. Thomas Paine wrote one of the most important books in American history, Common Sense. It is the book that helped galvanize the American Revolution. Thomas Paine is arguing against the monarchy, and what does he say in Common Sense? He says that when the revolution is over and the Americans have written their constitution, he hoped that one day in the future, a day would be set aside solemnly for proclaiming the charter, that is the Constitution, by which the world may know that so far as we approve of monarchy, that in America the law is king. For as in an absolute government the king is law, so in the free countries the law ought to be the king and there ought to be no other. That, in any event, is the theory of the American Constitution, and it's also the theory of our national sport, baseball. Thank you very much.